Welcome to Modus Cafe. Join us for fun, lighthearted, and educational conversations around training, athletic longevity, and the human side of climbing. With your hosts, Mercedes Pollmeyer and Katya Dow. Welcome back to Modus Cafe. Today I'm not talking to Mercedes. Instead, today I'm talking to one of your lovely members, Chris, from our membership. Um, yeah, we brought her on today to talk all about climbing, passion, training, everything we, we might get into. And we were just talking before we started recording, and I was talking about how um, I and we, you know, as Mercedes and I, we really believe in redefining training in general. Training is not just for the hardcore athlete, you know, as we talk about training really can be for everybody. And it's really more of an intention that we put into our climbing. And also with these interviews, we, um, you're the second member that I'm interviewing for the podcast, and I'm very excited about it. What we want to do with this interview is we want to um, kind of diversify or broaden the spectrum of people who are in the um, climbing community. Because when we listen to other podcasts, I feel like a lot of people who are being interviewed there are, tend to be professional, semi-professionals, or just people who not everybody relates to but you know climbers out there and people who train and love climbing are so passionate and, you know they, they are like they're such a diverse group of people and that's really what we want to do with this podcast and highlight some of them and so today i'm very excited to talk to you chris thank you so much for joining me this is my first podcast so i'm super excited <laughs> <laughs> that's very exciting so chris let's get started tell us a little bit about yourself who you are maybe a little bit about your you know, background in terms of maybe work and mm -hmm. family, that sort of stuff. Maybe where you live, if you want to share that, you don't have to, if that's too personal. And then we'll go into some of my questions. Okay. So, hi, everybody. I'm Chris. I'm from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I uh, work as a teacher and teach kindergarten. So that's my very busy job most of the day. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, I love climbing in the evenings and the afternoons. Um, I have a family. I have a wife and I have a son just one and that's great <laughs> yeah pretty short introduction i guess no that's great actually would you mind sharing just because i think it's so inspiring to me and you kind of just didn't mention this but what type of kindergarten teacher are you oh i work at a school for the deaf here in santa fe so my kids are all deaf or hard of hearing and um, i use sign to give all my instructions and teach pretty much everything people often ask me do you teach ASL and I so I teach in ASL so I teach in American Sign Language but I teach everything from reading writing math social studies science uh social emotional everything body yeah. training <laughs> yeah and all of that insane yeah yeah I remember the first time we actually met in person because we've been to Red Rocks together it was really impressive to me because I'm a non-native speaker right you know English is my second language and you speak sign language as a second language and I just remember being very um inspired um, by that, I find it very inspiring and I've seen you, you know, speak to your wife in sign language too. It's really fun. It's kind of this really fun looking secret language. And I just think it's wonderful that you can open up a world to deaf people. And yeah, I think it's really beautiful. So thank you for doing that work. And my wife also works at the school with me. So it's, it's great that we both have that language and that we can, you know, yeah. teach our son and sign to each other and. I was curious, is your, son pick... mm -hmm. is your son picking up the sign language too? So he did when he was really little. Um, mm -hmm. He probably said his first word at nine months old. And uh, then he signed pretty much consistently up until he was about two years old. And he couldn't come to the school that I work at. Unfortunately, you have to have a hearing loss to be able to come. And so he, we had to find a, you know, a childcare for him and the uh, child care system we went to didn't they didn't know any sign language and so poor Finley was signing to them about mm -hmm. everything and they weren't giving him that feedback as in signing back to him or they didn't understand his signs because a two-year-old for example isn't going to speak English fluently right they're going to use they're going to say words in English that are somewhat similar to English and then you know a teacher is going to be able to understand that that's what they mean like if they say baba maybe that means bottle you know, or something. And so in sign language, it's the same thing. So like if you sign sit, that's how you would say it in, you know, the actual sign, but he would do this. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that, and if somebody was deaf, obviously who was deaf and knew the language and saw that with him, they would say, Oh yes, please sit down. You know, they would reinforce yeah. that they understood him and give him that feedback. And since he never got the feedback, 
he just was like, okay, fine, I'll switch to English. Yeah. So then it's been a little hard getting him back into signing, Mm -hmm. but now that he's older, he's really aware of when he needs to use his hands to talk. Mm. And we always remind him, we've got some friends coming over, they're going to use their hands and he gets into it. He's definitely just, I think the maturity has helped him recognize that he can't use the English in that moment. He's got to switch to using sign and then he'll come and sign to us randomly, which is great. And then we of course reinforce it. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Awesome. All righty. I hope, you know, I hope that's going to continue and that he's going to pick it up. I think it will be a great skill to have. Yeah. Yes. We want him to keep, because that's part of our world. That's, you know, that's who I climb with too. I climb with a lot of deaf people. Yes. We go out and we go climbing together. And so again, it's just, I want him to be part of both worlds. Yeah, totally. And speaking of climbing, Chris, tell us a little bit about your climbing history. When did you start climbing and yeah, what kinds of climbing do you like to do? Um, So I primarily started as a rope climber. And um, I actually told this story to you a little bit before, but I was um, pulled into a climbing experience of going outdoor, um, climbing outdoors. That was my very first time climbing. I was 17. My friends were, these three guy friends were just into it. They had all their own gear and we lived in this little tiny town together and there was just no gym yet. And so the only place to climb was outdoors. And so they just kind of pushed and pushed and pushed and in a really sweet way. And I finally just said yes, so that they would stop asking me and uh, kind of haven't stopped since. And so starting out with, with ropes, that was, like I said, primary way of climbing for me. And um, it's funny because when I finally settled in Santa Fe and got into climbing at the gym in Santa Fe, climbing outdoors, again, still ropes. Um, and then I had two friends from the SEM, the same school that I work at, and they were Michael A partners. And they moved out of state at literally within the same month or something. So I lost both of my very trusted belay partners. And before auto blaze were a thing, if you didn't have a belay partner that you trusted, you pretty much ended up in the bouldering room. And that's kind of what happened. Um, how I got sort of into that world was I was telling my sob story to the front desk and a friend overheard it. And he was like, get over here, come climb with us. And still is a really good friend of mine today, but he was a V10 climber who was one of our like strongest setters in the gym who wanted me to come climb with him and his buddies. And I just, I didn't know why I didn't know. I was like, I'm so much lower than you. I'm probably was at a VB. Um, but he was so sweet about it. And he just invited me over and I started to kind of get into that world. And I found that world amazing and fascinating. And so I, I like to do both. Um, but if I'm going to the gym it's pretty much to Boulder, um, if I go outside, it's pretty much ropes unless I go to, you know, Red Rocks or Joshua tree with you guys, then I absolutely love bouldering and I don't usually do ropes out there because that's kind of all I do at home. Yeah. So totally. uh, yeah, he was, and then he actually became one of my, um, climbing coaches for competition in bouldering. Yeah. Fun. So you, did you do some, you did some early competitions then when you started climbing? I did. In your twenties? What is it? In your twenties? It was in my twenties. Yeah. When I really got into bouldering, I had learned the guy that I was climbing with. Um, he used to coach kids for competitions. And I, I was like, I'm kind of a kid in competitions. I'm so brand new to it. I was like, so I just randomly asked him one day, I was like, would you coach me? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. So it was just this friend to friend, one-on-one coaching experience. Um, and he, you know, he was great. Like, I mean, I've had before Mercedes, before you guys, I've had three coaches in, in, uh, training. And, um, I can now look back and go like really compare all of them, all the strengths and like things that I liked and things that I didn't like. But for him, I remember he did a really good job. We would go into the gym and it would be, you know, on site practice, reading a route and trying to get it in the first try. Um, we would do endurance, we would do power. Um, but I, and yeah, so I got into competition with him, but it was only for about a year of competing with him. And then I had another coach, uh, which was a female coach and, uh, also used, um, her training for competition as well. And it's just citizen comp stuff. It was just for fun, but I just Mm -hmm. thought two things. I was like, one, it kind of scares me. That's kind of why I want to do it. And two, because, um, I, I knew I would get better at bouldering if Mm -hmm. I did that, if I, and it was the first time I kind of ever went to a gym with the, with the idea, I'm going to do something specific that day. Whereas most times I think my mentality, my way of thinking about training or not even training, but just going to the gym was like, you just project every day. Mm -hmm. That's what most people do. 
mm-hmm. which in retrospect is not the best for your body to project every day, mm-hmm. you know, which I've learned obviously having more experienced coaches and getting involved in different kinds of training programs. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you anyway. for sharing that. And I believe, tell me, I think you just did a competition last year, even you still like to compete. I do. So, um, there's a, where I live in Santa Fe, there's a town, uh, an hour, about an hour South of me and they host this huge comp brings in like $10,000 for first prize or something. And uh, a lot of, um, people have come to, I think Alex Johnson competed one time, Alex Puccio, you know, competed. So we had some pretty big names a little bit before they became pretty big names, Ben Hanna, mm-hmm. people like that would come and, yeah. and climb at these places. Yeah. yeah. Ben Hanna was, um, my, my, you know, climber when I used to take kids outside. Um, I, I worked at the climbing gym and I used to take kids outside for, uh, for camps, like a climbing camp basically for the week. And he was in my camp. Yeah. When he was five or six years old. <laughs> yeah. So it's fun. That's so fun. Then Hannah. Yeah. I know. That's he awesome. Was... Well, he turned yeah. into a great climber. Yeah. He's a great guy too. He actually came to my classroom one year because we saw him in the newspaper when he was maybe 14, I think. And he was going to do a competition and he was going to represent the U S it wasn't obviously Olympics yet, you know, nothing like that, but he was going on to on with these other, you know, people from different countries. And so he was written up in the article in the newspaper and I just happened to be reading the newspaper one day with my class and he was in there and I was like, I know this guy. Mm-hmm. And they were all excited. So we did this whole unit on rock climbing in yeah. my class. And so then the, then he was our, our guest visitor. He came into my classroom and taught, talked to the, the little five-year-olds and they were just like, oh my gosh, yes, yeah. Ben. It's yeah. <laughs> I don't really, they didn't really know of him more than that, other than he was in the newspaper and now he's in our classroom. Yeah. And then he was so sweet because we, um, we took a field trip to the climbing gym and, um, yeah. he, uh, came with us and climbed. Yeah. I was wondering if you could just share a little bit, what does, um, competition look like for you now? What does your climbing look like? If you, if you're comfortable sharing grades, that would be wonderful because at the beginning of the podcast, I sort of shared that I feel like training is really for everybody. Right. And here you are, you know, your mom, your working mom, Mm-hmm. And you are still, you are very passionate about climbing. You've yeah. worked at a climbing gym. You're still competing, but mm-hmm. I would love to change the perception around what that means. So, um, I mean, I actually don't know what level you're competing at, but I know it's not, you know, you don't climb with Alex Puccio when you're competing. Right. But I think that's really important because competition can be so fun for everybody out there. Yeah. Right. You don't have to, gra- you don't have to climb B10 in order to compete and enjoy it. Yes. Yeah. Well, for me, competing is you get to climb on all the climbs that have just been set, you know, and people just, I mean, most of the time when I get to the gym, it's like, oh man, everybody's already climbed them all or they're greasy or they're wherever. It's like, oh, these have never been touched. You know, I think people get a little bit nervous with the, the way things are judged nowadays. When I was competing back in, you know, in a more serious, serious setting, I mean, this is citizen comps. This is not open level like you said, Alex Fuccio, Alex Jones, this is not that level of climbing. This is citizen comp, which is literally just, you sign up with your age group and your gender. And if you want to do non-binary, that's fine too. You just sign up as a category and then you climb and then, you know, they keep track of how many points you do and that's it. And you just get to have fun for three hours and then you get to afterwards watch the uh, competitors climb. Um, But I have kind of a fun um, competition story. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I don't know if I ever told anybody this before, but um, when I was first starting to compete with my friend, this guy that um, invited me to Boulder with him, back then you signed up as a category. So you would either be beginner, I'm sorry, like recreation, beginner, intermediate, advanced, or open. And you sign, you wouldn't even sign up as, I think you would not even do gender, you could do gender and then you would sign up as a category. And now you sign up as gender and age. That's Interesting. Actually, so that, interesting. Yeah. Because my gym still does the categories. Oh, really? Oh, I kind of thought yeah. I was done. I was like, well, maybe we've all moved on from this or something. And so I remember talking to my friend coach and I said, well, what should I sign up under? I mean, I am brand new to climbing. He goes, uh, pick intermediate, which is like V2 to V4, maybe something, whatever, you know, kind of that range. And so whenever I went to a competition in New Mexico or Colorado, they set them up that way. So it was, you know, intermediate one, intermediate two, intermediate three, all the way to nine. And then it would be the same thing with advanced and the same thing with open. So you could climb these other routes if you wanted to, you could jump on an advanced route to climb um, if you felt like you wanted that. But if you did too many advanced routes, you would be bumped up to that category. 
So they really made sure that you didn't just pick the easier category to get the higher score. So anyways, I did, I was the intermediate climber and I, I did enough competitions again for fun and just enjoyment that I got to go to regionals in California. And my mom came with me, which is so, you know, very sweet. And, and I, and she's like, I've never seen you compete. I've never seen this. Can I, can I watch? And I was like, sure. Like, let's do this, you know? And we, you know, I got to the comp and, uh, it's three hours and my friend actually taught me how to do the three hours. That was another part of our training. Like, how do you make it without burning out? in the first, you know, hour or something, you know, bringing your snacks, sitting down and resting in between these competitions. Don't just burn out, you know, give pace yourself, could pace yourself. You can do three hours. So I had a blast. He couldn't come with me on this trip. Unfortunately, I had a blast and my mom was watching and I end up kind of like right near the end of the competition, like three hours, I pretty much done. And I'm competing with this other woman who's in the advanced category. And we're both going head to head on this one climb, but it was really friendly and supportive and constantly spotting each other. And we're like, you got this and neither of us could top out. And uh, three hours are up and I come off the wall and I'm like, oh. you know, that feeling of just like kind of wrecked, but in a good way. <laughs> and um, I was so tired and three hours were up. And I was like, all right, you know what? The best part about competing is getting to sit back and watch the open competitors climb. That was going to be my favorite part of this whole experience was to sit back. So I finished my whole comp, I'm turning my scorecard in and I'm, you know, taking my shoes off and I'm like taking this tape off my finger, not injury. I just trying not to get flappers. And I was taking my tape off and I hear on the intercom, everybody saying, let's get ready for the comp, the open, you know, competitors are going to climb, let's get ready and, um, start to call different climbers to go back into isolation and they call my name. <laughs> Wait, which and category I, did you sign up for? Intermediate. Intermediate. Wow. So intermediate is like V2 to V4. I was V2 to V4. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure we're all like understanding the story. So you, you were competing at a V2 to V4 level, which is what's beautiful about citizen competitions is that you can compete at any level. I've done this before too. It's really fun. Like you said, okay, so go back to your story. You were taking your tape off and they were calling you out to go into isolation. They called my name to go into isolation. And I'm like <laughs> tape dangling from my finger. And I was like, what? And my mom is like, that's you. And I was like, whoa, 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 mom. This is a whole, these are, this is two categories higher than what I just did. Okay. And my friend's name gets called. Now she was in the advanced category. So we very quickly found each other and we were like, this has to be a mistake. We are, this is, this is regional. This, this is not just New Mexico and Colorado. This is California and whoever, I don't know if we were California, New Mexico, Colorado, maybe Utah, Arizona. I mean, this was a lot more people. And so we go to the front desk and we were like, Hey, what does this even mean? I don't, I'm sorry. You must've misunderstood. Like we're not that level. And he said, oh, we didn't have enough competitors. We had to pull mm. you up. <laughs> and we were like, we just climbed for three hours first. And second, that's two grades higher. I mean, even for me, for her, I'm a little bit like, you're a little bit closer. She's a little closer to open. But for me, I was like way down here. And he's like, you'll be fine. And I went, that's a lot of confidence coming from behind the desk. I'm like, you're not climbing. <laughs> Anyways, so we look at each other and we're like, once in a lifetime? All right, let's do it. So I got my mom back over and I was like, I'm doing this. I don't know why, but I'm going to do it. It's going to be fun. It's going to be great. We have to divide and conquer. I need food. So go get me like a Snickers bar and I need my water bottle. I'm going to go get my shoes and my hoodie. And I was like, go team Chris, let's do this because they were rushing us back to the isolation. Mm -hmm. So she gets all that stuff, I get all my stuff, and then I go into isolation. And I remember being in this cave with these other climbers, because you can't see, you're not allowed to see the wall. This is different than how competition is now, where they let people come out and everybody gets to look at the problems together and talk about it. This was the old way of doing it, which is you stay in there until they call you out. And I remember people on the wall warming up. And I was like, well, I mean, I know I just climbed for three hours. And I had to like put tape back on my fingers, which was, hard to take it off and put it back on again. But I remember being thinking like, maybe I should just get on, just warm up. I know I just, I know I'm probably still warm, but let's do it anyway. So I get on the wall and I take my weight and I'm just like, oh my God, it's like pins and needles up my fingers. And I was like, nope, nope. We're going to climb on adrenaline and Snickers, two things. And uh, so I'm sitting there waiting, just going, waiting for my turn. And in competition, they always bring out the person who has the least amount of points going in. So who got to go first? <laughs> I 
I did <laughs> on top of everything, right? So I go out and this other guy goes out and I remember getting called out and there's this like sea of people. Okay. Everybody's watching. And I just remember thinking, I've got my chalk bag. I've got my water. I just turn my back to them and I look at the route and I've got five minutes, five minutes to read it and to climb it. And I, I read the route, I remember seeing it. And then I'm like, all right, let's have some fun. And I got halfway up, which I was very proud of. I didn't, I had like zero expectations for myself. I was like, I just want to get off the ground. That's it. And so I got halfway up. I fell at one point. I got like some oohs and ahs from the crowd. I was like, really? Okay. Okay. I can do this. You know, and um, I, I got, like I said, I got halfway up. That was about it. I think I did the full five minutes on that one. And then they brought me over to the third route on the other end. And at this point, I have to sit with my back to the wall. Mm-hmm. Which is how, again, how the, they don't do it like that anymore. Um, so I just sit there. So I got my five minute rest while the next climber came out. So the sad part is I couldn't watch them climb. You know, I had to just completely look at the audience, basically. So then I found my mom in the audience at this point. And she's just like, yeah. You know, she's got no idea. She's just, it's so sweet, right? So she's looking at me and I'm looking at her and I'm just waiting for my five minutes to be up. And my mom, which I don't know that you've met her. You have yet, right? Anyway, she's a very honest person. And there's times where I'm like, okay, maybe honesty is not the right thing to do at this time. Maybe you could lie just a tiny bit. Because what she ended up doing is she looked past me to the climb and proceeded to read the route for me with the most terrified look on her face. Mm. And it was just like, I was like, mom, that's not helping. And she Mm. comes back down to my eyes and she goes, I don't know how you're going to do this. And I was like, not the time to be honest, mom, please. And uh, she just, you know, again, terrified look. And then my five minutes are up. I turn around and I look at the route and I'm like, oh no, she's hundred percent right. That's terrifying. <laughs> that was Uh-oh. way harder than I could have ever done. It was like a traverse with a couple little footholds. And then you kind of get around the corner and then you dyno to the top and you traverse across and then you dyno again. I was like, oh, your eyes were hundred percent accurate zigzagging, you know? So I got one and a half points mm-hmm. or two and a half. This is back when they counted each hold was a point. And if you held on, like, like with control, you got a point. If you got a little bit of control, you got half a point. So I was like two and a half points. I just kind of did the very beginning section. That's all I could do. And I remember thinking, I know I don't have to go the whole five minutes. I'm not going to wreck myself to the point of injury on these routes that I know are very hard for me. So I think I did maybe four minutes on that one. And then the last problem, it was extremely technical. I started to feel all my energy completely depleted. The Snickers bar was gone. It was, uh, you know, I had just almost nothing left at that point. And it was very crimpy. And I just, I I think I did three minutes maybe on that one. Um, And then I was done and they, you know, at the very end, they talked about, you know, okay, who got fifth place and fourth, you know, all the way up to first, whatever. So I went in fifth and I came out fourth. Nice. Congratulations. That's very exciting. I might have like a half a point on maybe sort of touching another client, another hold, but not actually with control. Um, so I was really proud of myself for that. And I'm also just proud of myself for saying yes. Yeah. I'm very proud of you. And and then I kind of, I mean, I kind of accidentally qualified for nationals Mm -hmm. in the open category. Yeah. Awesome. I I did say no to that. Yeah. I said it was a great experience. It's a great story. And I have a lot of respect for people who climb at that level and I'm, you know, no way that I can come home and train in six weeks to go back and do um, yeah. those, those types of climbs, but it was a good, yeah, good experience. Yeah. So fun. And thank you for sharing. Wow. Yeah. I'm so glad you got to experience that. It's really I'm fun. Sure, yeah, it's having, I've always seen it done with open competitors and how yeah. they have an audience, everybody watching yeah. them and stuff. So I'm, yeah. you know, I'm glad the nurse didn't get the better of me or, <laughs> or I said no. <laughs> So good oh, I really, I love it when people just live their lives and you've got this experience to share now. I do want to mention for people out there, it's it's very unusual that if anybody out there wants to try competition for fun, if anybody out there signs up, let's say for an intermediate category like you did, V2 to V4, it's very rare. I guess it happens as in your story, but I don't know if this would happen today, but I just don't want to scare anybody out there <laughs> that they think. <laughs> That's it's, not going to happen to It's really unusual just because um, more people climb now. As you said, they didn't have enough people that signed up for it, which um, 
good for them to pull the people out of the other categories and give them a chance to climb. I think it's really yeah. beautiful. It's yeah. awesome. And the level of climbing that open competitors do now, I'm like, whew, that's a whole different level that I've ever, you know, never seen. So my 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 competition days are back to citizen comps just going and being with a bunch of people who all have that same energy and passion and are ready to climb and get to climb these new routes for the first time. And so yeah. I, yeah, think I it's find really it very fun. fun and I'm always trying to get people to come with me, but I'm still waiting for that. Well, that if part. anybody's listening, <laughs> you know, they want to go in Santa Fe or where's this one competition that you love doing? It's, it's, not Santa Fe. it's Albuquerque. Albuquerque. In the Stone Age. Yeah. They do it uh, every October. Yeah, fun. Well, that's coming up, actually. Well, if anybody wants to go, you know, meet Chris there. Yeah. Are you going to do it? Um, I, it depends. I have a uh, injury I'm dealing with right now, and so I don't know that I will make it. Um, if I don't compete, I'll volunteer. I'll I help see. judge. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Chris. I like, um, to, I like that energy. Yeah. Let's okay. talk about training a little bit. Um, you know, you've been with us. You've been in our membership for a few years now, I believe. I don't know. I'm on four now. You're four, yeah. And wow, that's wonderful. I know. <laughs> you know, sometimes like some of the members who've been with us for long, it feels like family. So, mm -hmm. so do you. So would you mind sharing a little bit just what your training looks like, what your intention is with training, what you love about training, and really why you're still with us, you know, after four years. So we well, would love to hear Oh, yeah, I kind of want to start about how I ended up joining Modus because mm -hmm. um, it really kind of ties into the training part. So I had mentioned I've had previous coaches before, um, you know, two for competition. My third coach was actually all about power. And I think I knew that going in, I was like, how strong can I get and how fast can I get it? And that coach was a, a different type of coaching that you guys don't do. And I'm glad you don't. Um, because looking back, it was pretty harmful to my body to do that kind of training. And I didn't know otherwise. Um, and I, tr I remember training with him two days a week. It was just in his garage. He just set up this, you know, gorgeous climbing gym in his garage. And there was four of us women all climbing together. And I remember being so tired every time I climbed with him that the only training I could do was two days a week. And I was resting for five. Wow. Um, yeah, I was, I was, my hands hurt, my body hurt. I couldn't even climb outside for fun. Yeah, we definitely don't have training nope. plans like that. No. <laughs> it's our anti-philosophy. We yeah. want the opposite. We yeah. want people to not feel so fatigued from training. They shouldn't feel fatigued exactly. from training. Yeah. Well, and I didn't really know otherwise. I thought mm -hmm. my fatigue was because I wasn't as strong as these other women. I needed mm -hmm. to get there. Some of them were climbing outside and I was like, I have no energy to do that. And that should have been, of course, a red flag that you mm -hmm. should not just wreck yourself on these, you know, in this way by climbing two days a week. And I was, um, I didn't have that coach to say that otherwise. I also, I mean, he didn't even, I mean, I think sort of like later on, he was like, yeah, you guys should rest. Um, you've never mentioned that to me ever. So, I mean, did I get very strong with him? Yes. Did I do it in a short amount of time? Yes. And did I have the biggest climbing injury? Yes. With him. Mm. And I was, mm. I had my, my shoulder, my right shoulder was injured and I got, I was out for a year with wow. six months of physical therapy. And so to be at the top of my climbing, like to be at the top of the world, you know, it just, I was on cloud nine for a while. I was projecting lead five thirteens in the gym. Um, I was flying up five tens outside, um, projecting sixes in the gym. It was just a level I had never been to. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. And yeah, it was really fun, but I also had something, I basically just overworked my shoulder and I was out for the year. So I went from like way up here to way down here to just not even setting foot in the gym. Um, and then when I was ready to get back into climbing, I thought I've got tips and tricks. I, I kind of know how to get back. I've never come back after a year. I've had little injuries over the years, but nothing that put me out for an entire year. And I was like, I can do this. I can, I can guide myself back into the gym. And I started out one day a week and it was just like a five, eight staying on ropes, no bouldering. Um, and what ended up happening was I didn't trust my shoulder. So I overcompensated on my left side and I just pulled too hard all the time. And I got an elbow injury. And I was at an all time low at that point. I, at one point thought, okay, climbing isn't my sport anymore. I can't, I can't do this. But I also realized I can't do this alone. 
I can't get back into this, this space alone. And a friend of mine who was with me during that really tough coach that we worked out with, you know, two days a week, um, she was with me in that group. And then that, that kind of just dissolved and, and the co and the guy didn't do it anymore. And so everybody kind of went their separate ways. So Allison found Mercedes and Allison's had many coaches over the years. And Allison is a very, what I would consider to be a very elite climber. She's mm -hmm. not in the competition world, but she's just a very, very strong climber. And I saw that when I was training with her. Um, and so she was climbing with Mercedes and she brought her name up and she said, you should consider climbing with her or training with her. And I was reluctant actually, only because I thought she would be like my old coach mm -hmm. that it was just going to be about pushing hard. It was going to be about power. It was going to be just do this. And that's how, you know, you're going to get stronger or something there. I just was really nervous about that. And she was, Allison was very sweet. She's like, no, just at least zoom call with her and to, you know, call her up, whatever. So we touched base and I got on zoom with her and I, you know, I mean, we know Mercedes, we've known her, I've known her now for four years, you know, known her for a long time too. There's just this, she's so personable that you can just have mm -hmm. that instant connection with her. And so I was supposed to talk with her for maybe 15 and I think I kept her for 30, <laughs> but I was mm -hmm. just like, I just kind of poured all, I just felt so comfortable to just pour all of my heart and soul out and say, this is what I have gone through, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know how to go. I don't know where to go next or how to move forward. And it was kind of like, can you train me? And I was probably pleading with her in some ways. And she was like, yeah, Chris, I can train you. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be fine. You know, I was just like, yeah. oh, that's easy. I didn't. Yeah, you know, you kind of think because she's, you know, because Allison's training with her, maybe she only trains elite climbers, you know, yeah. maybe I have to catch up to all these people. I didn't realize, yeah. no, no, no. She trains everybody as you, as do you as well, just from, you know, from yeah. beginners all the way yeah. to, to, you know, extreme climbers. Right. And there's just that range that she has. Whereas I think yeah. this other guy was just more. I'm going to train you all. The easiest thing you're going to do in this garage is a 511 and there's nothing I can do yeah. about that. Actually, and can we pause just for a second? Cause that is so important. You said two things about Bob Mercedes that are so important. One, she's very compassionate. She's mm -hmm. a human and a coach. You yes. know, she's not just a coach robot, you know, like an AI coach that just mm -hmm. gives you a plan. No, she really sees the people um, when she coaches and also when she writes the training plans, right? Yes. And that's really important. And I felt the same way as you did when I started and training with her. And you will also say that another thing that you said is she's so good at knowing what people need at a given time where they're at in their training, which is why I want to have this conversation with you and others that training is not just for the elite. Mm -hmm. um, Mercedes has trained with, you mm -hmm. know, like she has trained national champions when they became national champions. Like mm -hmm. she's definitely, um, she knows her stuff when it comes to hard climbing. She's been at nationals herself, but she's trained such a wide variety of people from like beginners to elite and also um, all different age groups, which matters also, right? And she, I just wanna say this, you know, obviously I love her, but it's so important because that's the foundation for her training plans too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so thank you so much for bringing yeah. that up. Well, and that was my first time again, getting a coach from, with that perspective. Um, one of the things too, I remember joining my first zoom call with everybody, um, on modus. And at that time, and this was, I think Katya, maybe before you were in the group with us, I don't, it was a very small group and I was the only new person in the groups. Cause you know, now there's a lot more new people and everybody has like new member calls. Um, there was no new member call for me. It was like, okay, just <laughs> watch what we're doing and just follow, you know, just listen. You don't have to see, you know, you don't have to contribute or anything. So I just was, the very new person in the group. And I remember Mercedes had homework for everybody and they were going to review the homework together. And what she asked them to do was over the last one or two weeks or something, they had to write in their journal of all the ways that they trained that would be equivalent to all the points that they earned. So training points would be on one side. And then on the other side, she had rest points. Yeah. And she was, I want you guys to take points of how much rest you've given. And I was like, Oh my gosh oh my gosh, this woman is telling everybody, this coach is telling everybody that you have to rest as hard as you train. <laughs> and yes. I was like, I'm not going to say, I'm just like, I'm getting chills just remembering that. Cause that was to me was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be with you guys for a long time. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I we just love you so much. Yeah. But that is very important. We do believe that yes. you, you know, you rest as hard as you train. I was like, that should be your slogan. 
because yeah. it, people don't think about that. They don't think about include and people, everybody in their journals were like, oh, I didn't, didn't really rest a whole lot. I, you know, and resting doesn't mean being away from the wall or being, you know, in the, in your garage or something. It just means, you know, get yourself to bed on time. Um, you know, finish dinner a little bit earlier than, you know, don't eat past a certain time, take a walk, you know, there's just other ways to kind of rest as opposed to say completely stopping. Yeah. What we talk about is often rest and recovery, because that's really what it is about. And recovery is a, you know, it's a dynamic process. It's not just, you know, lie on the couch and watch Netflix. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about recovery, but it's certainly, as you said, it's very, very important. We take it very, very seriously because really when we train people, we really, really have longevity in mind. We want people to be healthy, fit, and strong for the rest of their lives, mm-hmm. very much so for the rest of their lives. I just started coaching an athlete one-on-one and she is 36 mm-hmm. and it's so fun. It's so beautiful. And yes, and so we try to minimize injuries, as I said, and we just really want to get people strong, generally strong too, and that also requires lots of recovery. And so, yeah, it's a it's a good balance thing. Thank you for bringing that up. And we yeah. very much believe that you can, you know, get quite strong by not, you know, beating yourself up in the gym. I think that's something that we're fighting against still because somehow that's that mindset sometimes for people. It's like when you train, you beat yourself up just like you described. So it was wonderful to hear you describe these other coaches. But yeah, we believe that's an old mindset and it's definitely not necessary. In fact, it's detrimental to your training yeah. and to your health too. Yes. And also I want to just say, because this is my new favorite quote is we love to bring um, life to our years instead of just years to our life. Meaning sometimes people, you know, get into fitness and because they want to live longer but we very much believe we're like well we do want to live longer but we also want to live and enjoy life now as strong and healthy human beings so let's not beat ourselves let's not get injured let's make sure we can enjoy even when we train we want to be able to enjoy training the best training is the one that you enjoy so yeah and i mean i think my previous coaches the three that i had training was always at the gym and, they, you know, I would go to the gym and we would do something at the gym. And so the mindset that I, you know, I it took me a long time for me to break was that training does not necessarily mean you're on the wall. Yes. And I mean, I, I'm going through two injuries right now. I have not been on the wall in a month, mm-hmm. but I don't feel like I've stopped training. Yes. That's beautiful. I'm still doing it. I may not be doing as much as I was before because on the, you know, there were, th- I would have three, three climbing days that I would do during the week. I can't quite do those. That doesn't mean I can't still do my workouts at home or on weights, or I can be in my garage and doing some flexibility or some strength or something. So for me, that's a a completely different mindset because even when I was injured for the year, I was, I thought, okay, well, I have to find a new sport. You know what I mean? Because I didn't think that training could be, and that outside of the wall, because that's all I had been taught. Oh my gosh, Chris, I'm literally having chills. I love, <laughs> I love that you're talking about this in some ways. I mean, I'm not glad that you're injured, but yeah. that is really the point of training. It is a lifestyle mm-hmm. and you know, you will make it through your injury. You might come out stronger. You will certainly come out of your injury strong because mm-hmm. you keep training in ways that you can, which is what makes you a strong, healthy human, he, human being and which is why you will be strong and healthy for a very long time in your life. And I think it's really beautiful. And that's like, it just makes me so happy because that's our philosophy is you just keep moving your body and you keep mm-hmm. trying with what you're able to do. And there's so much that people can do. Yeah. We have lots of members in the membership who came out of injuries um, mm-hmm. feeling stronger. And I will say one more thing that actually it can really help the recovery process from an injury mentally and physically when you keep, when you can keep moving your body, because it can be really hard mentally in athletes mm-hmm. too, if you stop doing right. everything altogether. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I didn't even think we would go there, but yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, that is sort of yeah the new mindset to training. That's what I like about the program that you guys offer because it really does. You know, there's so many things that I can the app basically. You know, I mean, I don't need a person per se to go to the gym with me to train. The app lines that all up for me. And if I mean, in the past, I've reached out. I once reached out to Mercedes and I said, I have COVID. I am isolated in my room can you help me with training in the room? And she was like, yep, work yeah. on this, on this, you know what I mean? She just gave me a little yes. training program. It wasn't like, Oh, figure it out yourself or something. Here's a list, whatever, yeah. you know, see what, you know, just do what you can do. She was like, yeah, do a couple things. I mean, she was just very, um, 
you know, open to giving me ideas. So I keep myself busy from yeah isolating. Yeah. And honestly, that's like the best part about being a coach too. It's just so fun mm -hmm. to help people in this way. And you know, it makes coaches be creative too, which is really fun. So yeah. And then obviously now, as you said, our membership is actually a lot bigger now. So you actually joined before a membership was public, which is why it was such a, yeah, which is why it was such a small group is what you didn't, maybe didn't know this, but it was kind of a secret society. Um, wow. Yeah, we weren't, I, I yeah. yeah, we were That's only public. Awesome. Yeah, we've only been public for not even two years now. Okay. So, you know, and so, yeah, so now our membership is a little bit bigger. So things are different. But as more people are injured or travel or mm -hmm. we have all these different challenges, like the more different types of programs we have for people. Um, so, well, the main program is actually a program like everybody's doing the exact same program. The program you can on the program, you can up level and down level. You can adjust the program to your individual needs. But as you have injuries or, you know, you travel or you have life happening, even just getting busier, there's ways of adjusting the program. Just like you said, we have an app and it's almost like a candy store. You'll yes. always be able to do something yes. to work on. And different people like having a, having a different focus. Some people like to focus on flexibility more. Some people like to focus on strength more. So for sure, we definitely support that. Yeah. And it's something Mercedes posted yeah. recently, which really helped me <laughs> and look at the training program differently again, was are you doing 80%? Yes, I love when she did that. Yeah. You talked about that related to nutrition. Yes. As yeah. well, right? Like eating 80% full. And that's always been related to food for me. But to say, have, or can you do 80% of your week? I was like, that actually makes me feel so much better because yes. like you said, life happens. I have a yes. son. Um, I have schedules with, you know, things with my wife and I, where we, we try to go to, you know, two days a week, three days a week to the gym. We take care of, you know, this, our son in between. And, and it's just things happen that don't, you know, that don't make those trips to the gym happen either, but to go, Oh, I, yeah. 80%. Cause I, I remember, I think I asked you or I asked the group, am I doing enough? Right. That was a kind of a small fear of mine was that, am I doing an, and this is, you know, pre-injury, but I just mean, am I doing enough to maintain improvements, I guess, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make sure that I'm not just plateauing, but that I am still. And so when that 80% comment came out, it did make me feel yes. better. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. That's one of the things we've talked um, quite a bit in the membership about too, this idea of like how to stay consistent. And that's one of our ways to stay consistent because we can get caught up in the hundred percent, but um, yeah, 80%. We like the 80% rule, you know, not just for nutrition. That's part of what we use in our nutrition course too, but yeah, definitely in, in working out also. So yeah. Good job, Chris. <laughs> Doing the 80%. No, 80% will get you so far. Yes. Well, and it's more about being consistent with the 80% than it is to yes do a hundred a couple of times. Yes, absolutely. That is so right. And you know, our training plans are designed with so much intention that the beautiful thing about climbing is, or our training plans is that you get a little bit of everything. So when you do 80%, you're still covering a lot of your bases. Yeah. And so. And it's not always about the gym. It's my yes. training. I remember thinking my training day is sometimes just my 20 minute stretch in the garage. Mm -hmm. And it just, it feels good to be like, click, you know, little yes. check mark. It's yes. a little visual you know, excitement to be like, I did that on that day, you know, whatever. Um, yes. just, you know, it's not, you don't have to go hard every time. And that really ties back into that whole, you don't have to project or wreck yourself yes. every time. And I think about all the coaches I've had in the past and they've all served these different purposes, right? We've got competition in one, literally power was pretty much it. And then I, this is going to sound really cheesy, but I was thinking to myself, why, do I, why do I like Mercedes and why do I like her program? And I was like, well, because I want climbing to be my forever sport, mm -hmm. which sounds kind of cheesy, but I just, no, that's yeah. why I'm with her and with you guys is because you guys bring so much more to the table, right? It's not just being at the gym. It's ways to do it outside of the gym, flexibility, nutrition, things that I've learned so much, which is why I am like with you guys for oh, another four or five years. Yeah. You know, whatever, however many years <laughs> I just want to keep climbing and I've, I've entered, I've suggested to some of my climbing friends to join you guys and their, their reasoning is fine for not, which is like, well, climbing isn't, I, you know, I want to do other climbing is just one thing that I do. I like to do these other sports. I don't want to devote it just to climbing. And even though I feel like you can do other sports and still do this training program, that's just where their mindset is right now. Yeah. So it's not going to, not going to push, push that, but try to help them understand that it isn't just about 
that's that's me personally. I want to just climb. That is my sport that I want to do. But that doesn't mean I still don't go skiing in the winter or something or right. You know, play basketball on occasion. It's just yeah. it's. Yeah, even that is something you recognize, you know, as coaches is that, you know, we're not, we can be very hardcore, but that's what the athlete wants. But we recognize that we consider climbing as more of a lifestyle that we want to incorporate into our lives, like the sport we want to incorporate into our lives, kind of what you said, to do forever, essentially, you know, until we're as old as we can be and still be on the wall and really have it be more of a lifestyle versus this reaching a certain goal. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, it's just a way to staying active. I mean, for me, it, it helps me mentally quite a bit. Actually, mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons I do it and to still keep moving my body. And and as part of that, it's important to be able to integrate it with work, to integrate it with family, to integrate it with other sports. Mm-hmm. And that is okay. And it's okay for climbing to even fluctuate a little bit like um, throughout the seasons as other sports come and go. Mm-hmm. For sure. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we are nearing the end of our podcast. Do you, are there any last minute words you want to share with people who might have never, who love climbing, but they might have never trained and they feel like it's intimidating or overwhelming and they don't know where to start? Do you have any tips you might want to share with those people? Well, I think the people are pretty chill and awesome. <laughs> um, our community is really consistent and, in, you know, incredible in that way. I, for me, I, I guess for me, I'm not as shy to just kind of jump into something, but I do see that side of it that it is a little bit intimidating to come in for the first time. But I would say, like you said before, we're kind of a, we're a whole range of climbers. And when we got together in Squamish this past summer, um, that was the first time I got to actually see people in person. I had only known them on Zoom. I'd only known them in like the group chats or something, whatever. And it's just so fast how it just a huge hug. And nice to see you in person. You're taller than I thought <laughs> because I've only ever seen you on Zoom, you know, whatever. And they're like, let's climb together. I mean, it, and it was, there was no intimidation around that for me because everybody's just so sweet and open and encouraging and no matter where you're coming from. And so yeah. I was like, just come hang out with us and come on these amazing trips. I've never gotten to go on so many amazing trips before. You know, I've been to Red Rocks, I've been to Waco Tanks, but it's always just been only if sort of other people kind of run it and I get to join. Whereas this one, it's like, should we do this? I was like, yes, let's do this. And then everybody gets all into it and we all, you know, get to climb together. And I just say that people are pretty, we're pretty chill. It's not, it's not elite level. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, It's just for fun. It's all fun. Thank you so much. And what I always like to remind people of too is that, you know, not everybody wants to be involved actively in a community as you are, Chris, which mm-hmm. which is what we love. But we have a um, big subset of members who actually just, they, you know, they come and they grab their training plans through the app. And there's no requirement to engage with the community. That is really just this big bonus for people who are looking for community, for people who are looking for friends literally all over the world if you want that. And so that's definitely a possibility, but also the way we design our membership is you can come, you can try it out for a month and then you can leave, like you can cancel anytime. There's no um, big commitment to it because one reason why I think people love our membership so much is because people want to be there and we want to keep it that way. We're not trying to lock anybody in. We're very much like our philosophy is we want people to stay because they want to be there. So, yeah. Well, and I love you guys so much that I sign up for the year, so I'm not going to you do get a nice discount. Yes. I have a yearly <laughs> membership with you guys. It's like, I have more of that than I have at the climbing gym. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, we love you so much, Chris. And love thank you, you so much for taking the time to talk today. It was really fun for me. You know, I've talked to you before mm-hmm. many times, but this was really fun. And yeah, thank you for your, for sharing your story. Of course. Thank you for asking. <laughs>